Turtle Island Reads is so awesome because the stories that we have to share are important. How do they deal with it? How do they feel about it? How do they live their everyday lives like that while we live our everyday lives like this? It's about this boy and he's like kind of... He's kind of going through, well, not like his coming of age stories. He's starting to hunt and he's uh, doing what the adults do, but at the same time he's not really there yet. He's not at that level. I kind of understand what part of life, what part of his life he's in. In this story, there's a young boy who's falling in love with a girl. And it's a very complete big difference from how we live and how we're taught to grow up. We read uh, Will I See You. The book is about missing and murdered indigenous women. People not caring about where they went or what happened to them. So Dana came from, all the way from Montreal. We talked about the book. These big Slavics, it says, speak Cree, but it's in the Slavics. And so unless you understand that, you don't know what she's saying. We also beat it. We did like a, a drumming activity or a spiritual activity, I would say. The Marrow Thieves. We're reading The Marrow Thieves. The book is about people killing indigenous people for, for their dreams. He's alone in the woods and he wakes up with a bunch of new people. Water is completely polluted. People are dying off. We're being sent back to residential schools. That's all a possibility if things don't change. As teenagers, there's a lot of relationship drama and like, when you hit puberty, oh boys, oh girls. In the book, he's kind of like, I want to do what they're doing. I want to be able to like go hunting and I want to provide for Saima and I want to do this and I want to do that. And then I'm sitting there, it's like, oh, well, there's where our similarity ends because I, I have no clue. And people are just like, oh, you got to go to college. You got to get a good job. You got to work hard. You got to play hard. And it's like, I am 15 years old. Can you not put the pressures of the entire galaxy on me, please, for once? I have always had this fascination with dreams. I want to be a psychiatrist when I'm older, so reading the book and hearing about how people have lost it and they're, they're so desperate to get it back that they're willing to kill indigenous people, it just fascinates me. It's because we have more people to judge us and all that when they're in like a community that is loving and caring. There's not really anybody judging. In a reservation, everybody knows everything about you. In a big city, you can look the way you want, dress the way you want, be the way you want, and nobody's gonna say a damn thing about it because you're you in a big sea of people that are just them. Hello everyone, how you doing? Good, I hope. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild, host of CBC Radio's Unreserved, the radio space for indigenous community culture and conversation. And I'll be your host, your guide, uh, your, your crazy cousin uh, on the stage for this third edition of Turtle Island Reads, a celebration of stories written by and about Indigenous people in Canada. I'm really happy and honoured to be here tonight. I, I, I always love coming back and talking with community, uh, and in particular a book club, because I am a lifelong Indigenous nerd. And uh, so what is Turtle Island Reads uh, book club and how does it work? Well, each year we pick three books written by an Indigenous author in Canada, and we choose three book advocates to champion them. Uh, this year, the book club has a special focus on our young readers, because the youth are our future. Uh, we pick three young adult books, each by an Indigenous author, and like in previous years, we send copies of these books to uh, English language and Indigenous high school uh, students across Quebec for their libraries. And this year, of course, we always want to do more, so we did more. Uh, we picked a three Quebec high schools to partner with and found SEC 4 and 5, that's grade 10 and 11 for the rest of the country, and teachers at those schools who wanted to read the books with their students. 
Each school group got copies of the novels, then we paired up each of our advocates with one of the schools and sent them out to meet the students there to talk about that book. And you'll be meeting this year's advocates and school representatives on stage with me tonight. And, but that's not all. There's more. Um, we also had other workshops happening as well. The Quebec Writers Federation sent three poet facilitators to the schools to deliver creative writing workshops with the students in the participating classes. Plus, CBC Montreal worked with CBC's education unit, Curio.ca, to release a teacher's guide and created an online book club for teachers to discuss Indigenous literature in the classrooms. All of those online resources are available for all you educators out there right now. If that includes you, I certainly hope that you check them out. Okay, let's get to the reason that we're all here today, a celebration of stories by and about Indigenous authors. So I'm going to get you all to uh, clap if you feel like storytelling is important in your life. Is that important, do you feel? Is that... Yes, 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 yes. Excellent. Uh, now, right now, there is what is being called a renaissance of Indigenous authors. Uh, they're writing, uh, their stories getting published in Canada, and it's a great time to celebrate this fact and to look at why Indigenous storytelling matters all the more today. Hopefully, today's event offers up some answers to that question of importance and relevance and representation. This evening, we're going to be starting with our students. That They're all these lovely young learners back here. Um, and we all come away with different things when we read books. For Turtle Island Reads, we wanted to capture some of the thoughts of the students we met, and you saw some of them in the video. And I have nine of them on a stage with me here. Let's give all of these students a big hand. All right, well, who wants to start talking about their love for their books? Let's start over on this side. We're reading uh, The Mouth East. It's about a, about a future where people can't dream no more, but the natives can. They're just trying to take their bow and marrow, and they're, yeah, they're just trying to get the dreams back. And what did you like most about it? I like that it's not such a distant future. Like, when the book is set it's a few years ahead it's not even 10 years from now and that it's just a possibility nobody knows what's going to happen now as young people how did you feel you relate you could relate to the story or what did you find that was familiar in it um what i found that was familiar in it is how they're like they try and stay in touch with their culture and by hunting and getting the teachings from meeg and he's like one of the leaders of the group so what did you read and, and what, how did you like it? Or did you so, like it? Uh, the book we read was Those Who Run in the Sky by uh, Aviak Johnston. Basically, it's about uh, a young boy in the Inuit community who's going through a uh, rite of passage to become a shaman. Uh, my favorite part of the book was probably the, watching him learn throughout his trip and uh, figure out his place in the world and uh, what it means to be a shaman. How did you relate to the book's focus on this, this very different teen experience than maybe you would have? Well, it was definitely nice to see a different perspective, but at the same time, there are a lot of things I could relate to as he was a boy my age, or around my age, so it wasn't too alien, but at the mm. same time, it was nice to learn and see what it was like for him. And what in particular did you find that you could relate to? Uh, particularly the girls in the story and how he gets <laughs> jealous around them. Good answer. There it is. I like honesty. I like that. And what about you on this side? What did you think about the book? What, what did I relate to the story? Yeah. Did, you, did you like the book? What was your favorite part? Yeah, no, I liked the book because of like, the type of story it was telling with like, otherworldly creatures and all that. I'm, I'm really interested in those types of books with like, worlds that aren't exactly like ours or with the whole him going to the spirit world. That was my favorite part, at least. Mm -hmm. Why? I just have an interest in stuff that's not usually what we know, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, stuff different than what every day is. Yeah, yeah, so it took you out of your, out of the common everyday world. And uh, what about over here? We got the schoolmate over here. 
Uh, so my class read Will I See by David Alexander Robertson. And uh, it follows a girl named May and her journey through discovering what's going on with her women uh, and her community. And it, it holds a message strong to Michigan murdered indigenous women. And as she goes on and she discovers objects from maybe other women that might have passed, uh, she herself gets into an experience and uh, comes out of it. And I think it's a learning experience for her and it reflects what's going on in today's society. Was, it, uh, was that something that you were aware of, the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls? Before I read Will I See, we had a little bit of discussion in my class about it, but I wasn't aware of it before we uh, started talking about it. And what do you think now about that issue? Uh, I definitely think that uh, it's a serious one and that we, we, should, we should treat it as a serious one and we should maybe... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, that more people should know about this in our country because it's happening every day and mm. we need stuff to happen for this horrible, horrible crime and stuff. Were you surprised to learn about the high numbers and the issues that many Indigenous women face? Yeah, when I heard about the high numbers at first, I was like, whoa, I didn't hear anything about this, mm -hmm. like uh, from the media or anything. I just, I never really heard about it before, like, such the high numbers that's mm. going on with our women and girls. Yeah. How did you feel about the whole experience of, of, the, of the advocates coming to visit, reading the book, learning about something that perhaps you didn't know? Um, I think it was really interesting to not only hear about my culture, but also other cultures as well. Having Dana come as, uh, to tell us about her culture and other cultures, as I said, outside of my own, it was really interesting to mm learn that. Do you feel um, that the book had, had changed you in some way and that you feel you want to do more about the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls? Well, I grew up on a reservation, so I was well aware of mm -hmm. the issues that take place. And I've heard stories, and but the book really brought them to life in a picture way. I've only heard stories and that kind of stuff, so it was interesting to see. Mm, well, thank you students for that. Give them some love. We're going to uh, tackle our themes with the, the front row of our guests here. Uh, we're going to first talk about the importance of storytelling. In particularly, we're going to hear from Lucy. Um, stories matter from the earliest days of our childhoods and throughout our lives. They pass down cultural knowledge and keep traditions alive. Lucy Tulagarjuk is an award-winning Enoch actress a film writer-director and throat singer. She's also one of our Turtle Island Reads book advocates. Lucy was born in Churchill, Manitoba and raised in Igloolik, Nunavut in 2018. Lucy moved to Montreal and made her directorial debut with the children's film Tia and Piyuyuk. It tells the story of a young Syrian refugee in Montreal who finds a magic portal to the Arctic, where she discovers a world of Inuit myth and magic. Welcome, Lucy. So nice to have you here. And you're really passionate about sharing, you know, the stories uh, from your people, your culture, your stories. What do you want young readers to get out of discovering this part of Inuit culture? The belief that we have always had that we are from the the earth, that everything around us connects with us. Um, the food we eat, the water we drink, uh, it's still part of us. So um, there's uh, Inuit believe that they are supernatural beings that are from the land. And uh, throughout my elementary school or high school, we didn't really hear about it until uh, Nunavut Territory came and elders would come to our high school class one hour a week to tell us about our legends mm. that we started to forget. Um, but uh, I grew up with my grandparents, so I knew a lot of legends and stories because I grew up <coughs> with older people that kept it. So cousins that were around my age were often hearing it for the first time when uh, it was not new to me. Mm -hmm. So to share it with non-Inuit uh, is good because 
uh, it's good to know other people's cultures mm -hmm. and their beliefs. Mm -hmm. It's not just about Europeans. It's, there's more to that in school. Like what they were saying, uh, it's, not, it's um, hard to see it or learn from it in school. So through books and films, it's our way of telling our messages, mm -hmm. our part of our story. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that uh, you had, what you said about the, the stories coming back, the elders coming back and telling the stories that Inuit have almost forgotten. How do kids react to that when they hear these stories and they're like, these are our stories that, that I've never heard before? How do they react? From what I've seen so far, because we've been giving a Tia and Puyuk tour, and the film relates to the book also. Mm -hmm. It has supernatural beings in it. And for Inuit, from small communities throughout Nunavut, uh, they feel like uh, they see themselves on screen, and that's great. Like you said, when I was a kid, I didn't really see books about Inuit or natives mm -hmm. and it was really hard to see it on film on screen so when k children see the kalupiluit is on screen or you know the takeksuk is on screen or um, the grandmother is telling the story of the legend on screen but it, it was they felt included they felt acknowledged mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and they felt important mm -hmm. yeah and that's the it's, important thing. And it's not just Walt Disney they're seeing on screen. It's, it's about us presenting ourselves using stories. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Uh, book advocate Lucy Tulagarja. Um, next, we're going to be talking about um, the importance of reading uh, stories outside of our own cultural experience. Do you all look for stories outside of your culture, or are you all about sort of just reflection? How many of you have read stories that are outside of your culture? I want to turn to two of the teachers on the stage to talk about why it's important for youth to read stories, and especially from outside their own cultural experience. Jennifer Baudois teaches at LaSalle Community Comprehensive High School in Montreal. She read Those Who Run in the Sky with her students, and Jennifer Waugh teaches at New Richmond High School in Quebec's Gaspé region, and she read Will I See with her students. Uh, let's start with Ms. Baudois. What reaction did you see in your students as, as you read this book together? We teach kids morals and lessons through stories, through books. And that shouldn't change once the child becomes an adolescent. We can still teach them a lot. Instead of just didactic teaching, and you should know this, and this is a lesson, you should be honest. You can tell a child that, but if you can show them, and if you can read stories about it, and if you can use a literature where the moral of the story and where the themes behind the stories are honesty and having integrity, then it, 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 it sinks in a little bit more. And I think that by using th this opportunity of kind of saying, okay, well, now you're in school, so you, you have to read this, right? Like, I, you're a captive audience, right? I've got you. <laughs> um, so just, just to kind of plant the seed. And, and to introduce them to things, even if it doesn't percolate, even if it doesn't really come into fruition now, I feel like I've done my part to at least do, to plant the proper seeds so that once they grow and mature, they can start making more educated choices for themselves. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Wall, what challenges did you have working with such sensitive material? Um, there were a lot of challenges mm -hmm. uh, with reading through this particular book. Um, it's it's a really deep topic, and um, I worked with just a group of five students, so that really helped. The topic is important. My students were fairly well aware. We had discussed it previous. We had done a few activities leading in. Um, the images presented in this text uh, for, for me as a teacher and the analysis that went along with those images, it's not something that... Uh, I have done a lot with my students, and uh, to kind of start with this particular book and having uh, this particular group who 
um, are quite artsy, if I can say that, <laughs> which I am not. Uh, they saw things in these images and that I did not see, um, and really they pushed each other to to discuss what they saw and to to go much deeper into the visual story than the story that's written in words. And uh, I found that we had some really good discussions. They had to inference a lot. They had to bring their knowledge, uh, their prior knowledge, full game with mm -hmm. this book. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Jennifer Watt at, from New Richmond High School and Jennifer Baudois from LaSalle Community Comprehensive High School. Um, reading stories makes our world and hopefully our hearts and minds much bigger. I want to talk about how storytelling can open up conversations, uh, making our world bigger. Uh, Dana Danger, my girl. Uh, is a two-spirit Métis, Anishinaabe, and Polish visual artist and musician from Treaty One Territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Dana performs as a drummer with the Montreal Indigenous group Odea. Dana identifies as gender non-binary and prefers the pronouns they and them. Ma they, is that better? <laughs> Ma them. Mom. Uh, and uh, <laughs> please welcome Dana. Dana, as, as you know, read Will I See and worked with the students from New Richmond High School. Dana, where did you even start this conversation with these students? It actually started before we even got there. Um, one of the suggestions I had, like it was great uh, being able to talk to Jennifer and uh, kind of like start that conversation before we even got there. You know, it's a crisis, right? Yeah. And so, and it's very apparent in, um, for Indigenous peoples. This is something that is like, that we feel very, very much so. So how do we even start to unpack that? And I knew that I needed time to do so, you know, to be actually be able to sit down and talk about things. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially if I have to drive like eight hours away <laughs> from Montreal, like I want to stay for a day or two, mm -hmm. you know, and get me in that, some new nice new camel while I'm up there. Yeah, but yeah. in all seriousness, <laughs> I see you're wearing very lovely. You know, you know, I represent. Match, match. Yeah, but no, in all seriousness, yeah, it was. It started even before mm -hmm. that because it's it needs that time to really start to talk about that and to really open up too. It's certainly a difficult subject. How did you, how did you um, interact with kids and make them understand that this was a very real, scary reality for many Indigenous women in this country? I think mostly we started to kind of like, we started really with unpacking the book and the visuals and like, you know, the students, they like brought, they brought what they got from that. And then we started to unpack it a bit there. And even so, I still feel like there was so much we could have really done, mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. like even certain symbols that weren't familiar to them, but are like, you know, cause the uh, Slavics for a lot of us, like we, we use that system and, um, and just to, to uncover the themes, like there's a lot of themes that are going on in, in this book to visually communicate such a complex and important um, issue in, you know, right now. Mm -hmm. So it was really just trying to start those conversations of just the material of the graphic design and then work from there to kind of build that up. You know, start with something a little bit easier that's tangible so you can get confident in it and then you can really, op you know, be open to kind of delving in a bit more. The other thing that you did is uh, you brought your drum, mm -hmm. um, introducing them to your two-spirit drum. How did that drum and the sound and the theme of the book connect for you? <sighs> that, I feel like that could be a story for like a whole day, but the Coles Notes version is. <laughs> like where we're from, you know, in so-called uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, growing up like, um, there's a lot of like gender, uh, like a lot of like gender roles imposed on um, us, depending on like what sort of like aspects of culture we're allowed to um, allowed to have or like allowed to be like a part of. And drumming was the one that I just never understood um, of like why women weren't allowed to drum, especially when I was like really young. And so um, I think that there's a lot to unpack there, especially as a person that's non-binary and that's like really trying to find where my role is because there has been a lot of erasure of those rules as well because of colonization. And so there's a lot of compassion and empathy that has to happen with that. But from other 
I just remember praying for two spirit elders so mm. much so just because I didn't, I felt like I just was getting it wrong um, in my own understandings of my, my culture, you know, of being the Anishinaabe Soto, you know, and, and Métis. And so, yeah, I think through that, I was able to find an elder that has, has so much teachings and so much knowledge around the drum as well. And it gave me that confidence to be like, okay, I've been dreaming about this, you know, speaking of dreams, like I've been dreaming about this for a while. And the, like, um, you know, if a big drum is seen as being something that's for men only, what does that mean then when two spirit people and women and everybody can come to that drum together um, in our, you know, in our culture? Because we're not all like the same too. Not all of us even have big drums and stuff mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was important because for two spirit people, there's a, like a, um, a lack of knowing your place. And so I think that's part of it too, is like showing that to um, the youth because I could have really used that when I was younger. I feel like um, anytime that I see anybody that's really um, grasping their language, their culture, the songs, like whatever that can be for them, it's, it's truly, truly is empowering. So that's why it was so important to maybe be the first kind of like visit for that drum. We just, we awoke it like just the week before mm. in the city. And that's what that Two-Spirit Elder said is this is for healing. This is not a competition drum. Mm. This drum is meant to like heal those folks that just are hurting, that just like don't, you know, it's harm, this drum is harm reductive. This drum doesn't care if you wear a skirt or not. It doesn't <laughs> care like what's in your pants. All it cares about, you know, is you and your heart and like wanting to be there and to share, you know? So there's a lot of different um, nations that come to that drum. And through that is also that exchange that happens in a, a good, safe way, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is like, I think what it hopefully always was supposed to be like. Yeah. So that's why it was so important to bring it yeah, and making those connections. Yeah. And just for our audience, the big drum is the big the powwow drum that you see at powwows that uh, that makes the the sound. And then there's the hand drum, and that's generally thought of as to women can do one drum but not the other. But that is changing. Yeah. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to hear from a student, uh, Mariah Allen from New Richmond High School. Um, she read Will I See and met with Dana and did workshops with her together. Uh, she's going to read a bit of her own writing that's influenced by the book and inspired by the book. So uh, where's Mariah? So I'm going to give her a hand over a microphone. I think the reason people should read the book, Will I See, is because it not only speaks volumes about real life events that happen to real people day to day, it speaks about a culture some people know very little about. While there are many aspects about this book that move me, I would like to draw your attention to one specific element. I was told the author and illustrator collaborated on the decision to include syllabics in the background image on almost all of the pages where anything questionable was taking place. And in my opinion, this is extremely powerful. In a way, these syllabics provide answers in a language you won't understand, like an echo of every native spirit that surrounds the main character throughout the story, like a warning. It's almost a creepy, beautiful way of interpreting whispers. At least that's the way I interpret them. They're almost all in Cree until you reach the very end, and only then do they show the syllabics as written words. Only then do we understand them. The Slavics turn into the words of her grandmother, telling her to remember that the monsters that scare her are just people. I think it's a symbol, symbolic way of finding her own voice mixed in with every other woman's. She's connected with them through the cycle, but thanks to her, it's now broken. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mariah. Such a profound interpretation of uh, some of the images in that book. Um, thank you for that. Um, next, we're going to be talking about seeing your own experience um, reflected back in what, and why that matters. How many of you read books or see movies or listen to other media that reflects your cultural background, your life experience, your stories that you, you see yourselves in? So pretty much everybody. Why is, is that important to people? Is that important to see yourself? Uh, so let's talk about the importance of seeing ourselves reflected back in what we read, in what we watch, whether that's books, movies, TV. What would it feel like to be in a world where everyone can find stories, films to connect and resonate with us? What kind of empathy would that create for each other? 
Tracy Deer is an award-winning Mohawk filmmaker from Ganawage. She created the APTN dramedy Mohawk Girls, and she has just finished a stint in Hollywood. Working as a writer, that's how it's pronounced, right? <laughs> uh, working as a writer and co-executive producer on the CBC Netflix series Anne with an E. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you. When you were growing up, how often did you see in books or, or movies or TV of yourself reflected? Zero. Just like, just like you. Mm -hmm. um, I did not see, I did not see myself reflected and in the, the rare glimpses that I did see um, an indigenous story, it was on the news and it was very dark um, and very depressing mm. and also um, very one-dimensional. You go in, you get the sad story, you get out. There was no context, no understanding of why is this thing happening. Um, so it, it was, I, it just felt very hopeless. The message I was receiving as a child was that my reality was hopeless. Mm. And did it make you in turn feel hopeless? Yes, yes. I, I suffered from um, issues of self-worth and low self-esteem. Um, I, as a little child, you know, we all grow up dreaming, which is uh, w one of the reasons why I love this book, but we grow up, we all grow up equal, I think, and we all have these dreams of, I want to be this and I want to be that. Mm -hmm. But then you get to a certain age where you start to receive the messages that our dreams aren't possible. And part of that is because we don't see it happening. We don't see it on screen. We're not reading it in books. We're not seeing the role models out there doing it. So I know at some point, my dream to become a filmmaker, I was told that's impossible, crazy, it'll never happen. And I was told it over and over and over again. Sometimes I was told it by teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, was, I also had teachers who told me otherwise too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. and, uh, and my mother. Mm -hmm. My mother really is the, the reason I am sitting here as a filmmaker and sharing stories because my mother from a very young age told me I can do anything I set my mind to. And she, she told it to me like a, like a, a drill sergeant in Mantra. the army. I mean, it was every day I was told. And my mother was, you know, the boss. Our mothers, well, sometimes our fathers, but in my family it was my mother. Uh, and if my mother said I could, well then, my mother's not wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's what helped me to push past the reality around me and say, no, I, I'm going to prove you wrong. I can do it. We can do it. And it's wonderful now, 30 years later, to be here and to see how much it has changed. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I hope that it is a different reality for our young people now to have all of these examples and to see themselves reflected. And I hope that they, they, they know that their dreams are possible. Mm -hmm. So Tracy, what do you hope for uh, the young generation now in terms of story building, story reclaiming, story making? It's exciting that I think the next phase is to now go into just a creative space mm -hmm. and explore stories that like really spring right from the imagination. And that's what, that's what really excited me about the Marrow Thieves. Meanwhile, the themes are all still very current that we need to discuss, mm -hmm. but it's a very safe way in. That's another thing I liked about the book is residential schools. It's a very dark time in our history. It's a very difficult subject matter, much like murder and, and missing indigenous women. And the book, because it's in this, this dystopian fictional space in the future, I think makes it a, a safer way in to understand and explore and um, emotionally connect mm -hmm. without, without shutting down and running away. Because really it is a very dark, horrible history that th this country is responsible for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Book advocate, Tracy Deer. All right, so who thinks that stories can make a huge difference in how our children see themselves? Let's buy applause. Yeah. So we're going to go back to the teachers. Back to you guys. Yay, teachers. <laughs> 
uh, that can help us grow and help them learn and, and expand their, their viewpoint of the world. Heather White and Chrissy Goodleaf are two members of the language arts teaching team at Ganawage Survival School. They've been reading The Marrow Thieves with their students. Please welcome them. Now, you both teach at a school that offers a culturally based education. How often can you read um, Indigenous authors and histories with your students? All the time. <laughs> All the time? <laughs> we, uh, we're very lucky that we ha work at a school that um, gives us the freedom to bring in any novel we want and bring in any topic that we want. Mm -hmm. So working with our team, uh, just a shout out to our teammate up there, Rainbow Jacobs is not down here with us right now, <laughs> but we work in a trio mm -hmm. and we create everything based on what's either in the media, what's uh, the, the, the students' interest, what they bring to us, mm -hmm. and uh, what we just happen to run into. Yeah. So yeah. luckily we have that freedom and um, it's really important to bring in our stories and bring in what they um, want to explore. Mm. Yeah, we're, sorry. How does that We work as a yeah. team, so we're so used to just finishing, <laughs> <laughs> finishing each other's sentence. But to honor what she said, at Gunnawagi Survival School, we're just celebrating our 40th anniversary. Woo! So that's 40 years. <laughs> Yay! So that is really 40 years of almost not resistance, but this counter movement to empower and to educate mm -hmm. our students based on our truths and our histories. And we're really fortunate, like the other people on the panel have said and the other, the other advocates said, we're living in a time and in, in a place of luxury in terms of abundance of storytelling that our generation didn't have when we were in the position that maybe we would be sitting up there. Mm -hmm. So we bring in what's important to them, but also in a way, almost what's important for us that we missed, mm -hmm. that we want to give back to them to help propel the next generation of storytellers, creators, artists. Like we're in a really, really great position to be mm -hmm. able to do that mm -hmm. and to help make that change. And how do you see it impacting the students? How does that affect them, knowing that they come to school learning about their, their own peoples, their own histories, their own stories? Well, I just want to clarify, because I don't know if a lot of people know out there, but um, Guatemala is their viable school. It isn't, you know, we're not... So we're not uh, doing like survival skills necessarily on the yeah. outdoor <laughs> skills. The idea is survival of the culture and language. Yeah. yeah. And so we end up, it, it's, it's vital. It's vital because uh, we're both second generation survivors, survivors of residential schools. Mm. And the disconnection that we have, I mean, we got to reconnect. It's got to be there and it's our responsibility. Who Why? else is going to do it? Why do we have to? This is a question that I hear very often from um, mostly non-Indigenous Canadians. Why do we need to connect to our cultures? Why is that important? You have to know where you came from. You have to know who you are in order to go on to live in the world, to be able to connect, connect with anyone else. You've got to have a sense of self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've inherited this disconnect. Right? Like we said, both of our fathers went to residential school. So we are coming as a direct result of this disconnect. And we're at this position as, as educators, as community members, uh, family members, you know, we work and live in our, in our community, that we can help connect that because it's building that sense of self, building that sense of, of community and reclaiming that identity. And we get to do it through story. In our department, through language arts, we get to do it through stories. We get mm. to tell stories. We get to read stories. We get to make movies. Like These are all things that I wish I would have been able to do. So maybe I could have been like Tracy too and being able to make these things mm -hmm. happen because we first have to admit that there was a disconnect. And we have to grasp onto that to make sure that the next generations for the next 40 years isn't, isn't totally fighting to reclaim it, that mm. we are giving them the opportunity to take it and let everything rise and strengthen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll throw this out, out at you because um, I often hear this as well. Um, why do we need indigenous cultures at all? Why not just assimilate, which is what you know, residential schools meant for us to do and just be part of the mainstream? Where you come from, the part of the, the world that you come from has everything embedded in it. 
It's the land, it's what you get from the land, it's what you do with the land, with each other, mm -hmm. that builds you. And that's what was taken away. That's what, the disconnection to the land, the dis disconnection to each other, not allowing siblings to see each other, mm -hmm. not allowing parents to see their children. I mean, what that connection. As human beings, we have, it's an innate, necessity that we need to connect with one another mm -hmm. and it's we it's it's a, it's also a necessity to connect to the land and that disconnection was purpose purposefully made to our people we need it, it it's all in, it's all embedded we're all creatures of the earth you know it's like asking why why should a whale be a whale <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and that sums it up nicely i like that on the flip side if you're saying well why don't we just assimilate i think the bigger question is why didn't the, the all the why didn't the colonizers assimilate to us <laughs> if retention of identity and retention of language and retention of culture was so important to everybody else who came in and got like the best rental deal in history why <laughs> why is it important enough for you to fight for it and not for us mm -hmm. like that's the million dollar question why is it only important for you and that's why as teachers, as educators, we all have a responsibility in this room, whether you're a parent or youth, you guys are here, we have to make sure that we understand when we are looking at stories, you always have to be conscious of the stories that are missing. Mm. Because if there's anything that I've heard tonight is that there has been this absence of our own narratives and our own storytelling. And this, is a, this event is a perfect example of why. Mm -hmm. Because... Something is missing, and we are all responsible to bring it back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, give some love to our panelists, our students back there. Thank you so much for joining us for the third edition of Turtle Island Reads. And now I'll leave the last words to our students. It'd be good to hear more about like representation of Native people from Native people and to be less ignorant of you know, things you don't know and learn more about other people's culture because I feel like people should, people should have an open mind to uh, the way other people live and uh, their traditions and their, their beliefs. It's awareness. It's, the book is mainly about awareness. It's not just to hit Indigenous people, it's to hit everyone all around. Well, if they're not Indigenous, it's a great way to like, kind of get to know us in a better sense because all the stereotypes out there of us. So. I said, I'd recommend it to them, be like, here, take a look at what we actually are, or used to be, or the truth. And as for a native person, be like, here, re read it, you can find something new. <laughs> like, it's pretty interesting stuff, like every author brings something new to the table, so. I'd say you should read this book, because uh, it gives you an uh, uh, image of what's going on in Canada and stuff, and it's really informal, I think you should, could say. It's really important to know things about, like, residential schools, the missing and murdered indigenous women, the 60 scoops and everything like that. I think it's important because like they don't know much about us than what's said and there's not like nice things said. So like if they read the books and like all the books don't really explain how we are from then and now and we kind of like switched a bit. There's women going missing and being murdered there's people that are, they're going through traumas because of past traumas. There are people that are substance abusers. They should learn about that, how we're going through issues because of things that happened a long time ago. We know a lot of other people's history, but a lot of people don't know ours. They bring another person's way of thinking to you. They show you how somebody thinks and how they believe something should be or something can be. It's just a different opinion to hear.